an architect named Craig. One day, he was invited to a farmhouse to talk business. But here's the strange thing. It was his first time here, but it felt like home. At first, Craig wasn't too concerned. He thought he'd been to a similar place before. But when he followed the farmer into the house and saw his family and friends, he was stunned. He realized he'd never seen these people before. But it was as if he'd seen them in a dream. As the feeling grew stronger and stronger, Craig suddenly called out directly. One of them by name. Dr. Van Straten. You're a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist didn't believe the lie, thinking that Craig might have read about him in one of the newspapers. That's why he remembers him. But Craig insisted. He has the same nightmare every night. Not just about the shrink, it's about everyone there. In his dreams, the shrink thought it was crazy, so he asked him to describe the dream. But Craig said he couldn't go into too much detail. All he could remember was that it won't be long now. There's going to be a woman in a hat here. And at the end of the dream, something really horrible happened. I thought that such a bullshit paranormal incident. I thought no one would believe it, but it turns out that except for the psychiatrist who didn't believe it, except the psychiatrist, everyone believed in it because every one of them had experienced and explained paranormal events. So John, the race car driver, rushed to tell the crowd, to tell the crowd the first horror story he'd experienced. A few years ago, he had an accident during a race, but luckily, John didn't die, he just suffered a blow to the brain. He was temporarily in a coma, under the care of the nurse. John soon woke up, but the night he woke up, something strange happened. As soon as the nurse left, John heard someone singing outside his window, and the clock was showing 9.45, but now it was suddenly 4.15, so he went over to the window, and opened the curtains, but what he saw frightened him, because the dark night sky suddenly turned into a sunny day. And what's even more bizarre, there was a coffin-drawn coachman downstairs calling to him. Just room for one inside, sir. As John returned to his bed in a daze, he realized that the clock had suddenly turned back to 9.50 and the scene outside was back to normal. John suspected that he had been knocked out of his mind, but the doctor said his body was fine. He told him to rest. Don't think too much. A week later, John was discharged from the hospital, but just as he was about to take the bus home, a man in the front row suddenly asked him what time it was. Yes, it's quarter past four. Thanks. John hadn't realized anything was wrong yet, but just as he was about to get on the bus, Just room for one inside, sir. He saw the driver, was the same driver who had pulled the coffin before. John was too scared to move, as if fate was reminding him not to get in the car. Sure enough, in a few seconds, the bus had an accident not far away. As soon as the racer finished his story, a woman in a hat suddenly visited him, and this scene was exactly what Craig had said. But even so, the psychiatrist believes that these events are purely coincidental. He even suspected that everyone in the room was playing a trick on him. While the crowd was arguing, the little girl Alice interrupted them and began to tell the story of a strange event that had happened to her last winter. That day, he was invited to a Christmas party at an old castle. During the party, Someone suggested a game of hide and seek. At first, Alice and Peter hid behind a curtain on the first floor, but Peter never thought it was perfect, so he dragged Alice to hide in an abandoned room. It is said that there was once a murder here. A girl suddenly went mad, strangled her brother to death. After that, People often saw the boy's ghost has been seen wandering around the house. Peter wanted to take advantage of Alice, to take advantage of Alice, but he didn't think she'd take it. After cursing the pervert, he took the opportunity to sneak into a more private room. But as soon as he walked in, he saw a little boy lying on the sofa crying. Alice's motherly heart aroused, rushed over and hugged her. But as he hugged her, she realized that she hadn't seen her downstairs before. I wondered where this little one came from, so she asked her name. What was her name? The boy said his name was Rati. This is the room where she lives with her sister, Martha, but her sister was very bad, always threatening to kill him. Alice didn't think much of it. She just felt sorry for the little guy. So she not only kissed him on the cheek and sang him a lullaby. A few minutes later, Alice came back downstairs and told everyone what had happened. Peter thought Alice was playing a joke on him because this little boy, Rati, he mentioned in the room earlier, the little boy who was strangled by his sister. It was then that Alice suddenly realized she should have encountered encountered something dirty just now. After Alice finished her story, everyone felt scared, but the young woman Marilyn said her experience was 100 times more terrifying than Alice's. The story began a few weeks after her engagement. She remembered that it was her fiancé Charlie's birthday, so she spent a fortune. She bought her an antique mirror as a gift. Charlie loved it at first. He had it installed in his bedroom. But the next day, when Charlie looked in the mirror again, something strange happened. He found that the scene reflected in the mirror seemed different from the real room. 
Charlie was so scared that he closed his eyes. Luckily, when he opened his eyes again, everything was back to normal. At first, Charlie thought he was seeing things. He didn't take it seriously. But when he got off work at night and looked in the mirror again, something horrible happened again. <laughs> This time, no matter how Charlie opened and closed his eyes, the image in the mirror never returned to normal. Charlie was so scared that he rushed to tell Marilyn about this strange incident. He even suspected that there was something wrong with his brain. But Marilyn thought, maybe it's because she's getting married soon. She thought it was a hallucination caused by her nervousness. And so, she took Charlie back to the mirror to calm her down. To calm her down, and then try to raise her head again. You're not there. But of course I'm there. I tell you you're not. By now, Charlie had decided she was out of her mind, Gracie, but Marilyn didn't believe it, so she kept encouraging her. Eventually, with the efforts of the two of them, Charlie seemed to overcome his fears, but the good life didn't last long. When Marilyn came home to visit her mother, Charlie realized that the old house in the mirror had reappeared, and this time, the mirrors seemed to be trying to devour her. On the other side, Marilyn was walking past the shop that sold her the mirror. She wanted to go in and ask the owner where the mirror came from. Instead, she found an antique bed, and this antique bed seemed to be the same as the one in the mirror. In the mirror, then the boss told him the antique bed and the mirror were actually a set, and their first owner was a man named Thurington, but something tragic happened to him. Thurington was out hunting one day and fell off his horse. The horse broke his spine. Since then, Thurington has been paralyzed. He had to stay in bed all day. He became withdrawn and irritable. He accused his wife of being unfaithful to him. In the end, he strangled his wife to death in the mirror there. He strangled his wife in front of the mirror. He slit his own throat when Marilyn heard the story. Marilyn was instantly terrified, so she rushed home. But by now, Charlie was out of his mind. When he saw Marilyn, he cursed him. He told her that he kept himself tied up in his room so that he could go out and meet other handsome men. Marilyn realized that her husband was probably possessed by Thurington, so she shouted at him. But by now, Charlie had lost all sense of reason. The next moment, he strangled Marilyn with a silk scarf. In a panic, Marilyn grabbed a stick and smashed the mirror. After the mirror was destroyed, Charlie regained his senses, and after hearing her story, after hearing her story, the psychiatrist, who never believed in ghosts, she told the story of the scariest thing she had ever encountered. That day, the psychiatrist was commissioned by a friend to come to the prison to assess the mental state of an inmate. The inmate, well, was a local woman's whisperer. He was accused of attempted murder of another puppeteer. But Will wasn't very cooperative with the psychiatrist's questions. Will was not very cooperative. He just kept asking the doctor to give him back his puppet. There's no other way. The psychiatrist could only start with the victim's statement. To understand the situation first, it says, Will was a famous puppeteer in the area. In his hands, the puppet seemed to come to life. <laughs> But soon, Will's expression became grave because he suddenly realized the puppet in his hand seemed to be out of control. I'm just about through with that cheap ham anyway. Oh. When he saw that, Will had to end the show early. He thanked the audience and left in a panic. But it wasn't long before the puppet. The puppet poked its head out from behind the curtain. I'll be waiting for you in my dressing room. You and I have got to talk business. The man in front of us. Bauer is also a poet in the language of women. After receiving an invitation from Hugo the Puppet, he knocked on the door of his room with great anticipation. But when he entered, he realized only the puppet himself had been communicating with him. But his master, well, was nowhere to be seen. While Bauer was confused, Will suddenly came out of the toilet cubicle, seeing that Bauer had not asked for his permission. Without his permission, he was very angry. Sorry, but... I can't bear anyone touching him. Bauer was not happy about it. It was Will who used the puppet. He invited him in. Why is he suddenly not welcome? Listening to Bauer, Will realized that the puppets were probably in on it. How in heck could I team up with Hugo? He's yours, isn't he? So he said he was tired and asked Bauer to leave, but suddenly... Ignore him. I'm the one who gives orders around here. He's only... At this moment, Bauer felt that this guy is not right in the head, but just turned around. The two of them were confused. <laughs> Don't leave me. Bauer was so scared that he left the room. But a few days later, he met Will again in a hotel. He was drunk, and it just so happens that the two of them live next door to each other. So he was kind enough to send him back to his room to rest. But Will didn't seem to appreciate it. He thought Bauer was approaching him on purpose. He must have wanted to take his puppet away from him. But Bauer didn't want to bother with a drunkard. But Bauer was kind enough to take Will to bed. But in the middle of the night, Bauer suddenly woke up by a sharp knock on the door. Opened the door and found Will came to the 
the door. He accused Bauer of stealing his puppets. He began to rummage around the room. Bauer thought he was sick again. He urged him to leave. But then, just then, Will actually found the puppet on his bed. Not waiting for Bauer's reaction, Will shot him in the arm. You dirty thieving swine! Luckily, Bauer survived. After reading the statement, the doctor was of the opinion that the key to a complete understanding of Will's state of mind lies in the puppet named Hugo. So he ordered the guards to put the puppet in his dark room. While he stood in the doorway and watched his behavior, Will was very happy to see his old partner, Hugo. I knew you wouldn't leave me, Hugo. I knew you'd come back. But the puppet said he didn't want to be around a murderer. Will was not happy. He accused the puppet of forcing him to do it. If the puppet insisted on leaving, he'd tell the police the truth. But the puppet listened, and he didn't panic at all. I can see what happens. They'll put you in the madhouse. When Will saw that the puppet was going to leave him, suddenly, his face turned into a grimace. Then he grabbed a pillow and tried to smother the puppet. By the time the psychiatrist rushed in, he'd already crushed the puppet. Since then, Will became a psychopath. He hasn't said a word to wake him up. The doctor brought Bauer to visit him. When Bauer greeted him, Will immediately came to his senses. But then, the next thing he knew, the noises he was making were very strange. <laughs> After hearing the psychiatrist's story, the racer poured him a drink, but by accident, the psychiatrist's glasses hit the ground and broke. After seeing this scene, Drake suddenly became serious, because he remembered that in his dream, whenever he broke his glasses, something horrible would happen. So he panicked and said he wanted to talk to the psychiatrist alone, and asked the others not to eavesdrop. After everyone left, Drake's blurry dream started to come together. He remembers that he killed someone at the end of the dream, and it was no one else, it was the psychiatrist in front of him. Then Craig started to go crazy. And the next thing he knew, he strangled the psychiatrist with his tie. After strangling the psychiatrist, Craig was hallucinating. He saw himself playing hide and seek with a bunch of kids. And then, Craig hid in the room where the murder took place. Inside, he saw the strange ghost again. <laughs> Just as the girl found him and was about to scream, Craig suddenly put his hand over his mouth and dragged him into the room. He punched him to death. Take a seat, sucker. Then the puppet and Bauer appeared. They not only laughed at him for being a psychopath and accused him of being a murderer. Hi, Hugo. We've never played to a murderer before, have we? In the end, Craig was surrounded by a group of people. He was taken to prison amidst the cheers of the crowd. Just room for one more inside, sir. <laughs> After he was put in jail, Craig saw the most beautiful thing in his life. Craig saw the most horrible thing in his life. He saw a puppet turn its head and stared at him. Then he stood up and walked over to him and grabbed him by the neck. And then the scene changed. Craig suddenly woke up from his bed. It turned out to be a dream. And then, Craig got a phone call. It's Joe, the farmer inviting him to the country to talk business. He was invited to a weekend party, but by now, Craig had forgotten the nightmare. He didn't hesitate to say yes, and Craig drove to the party. But the weird thing was, it was his first time there. But there was a sense of familiarity that he'd been here before. 